Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I congratulate all of you on your acceptance to Harvard College. You've entered a great place. I've had the privilege of serving this institution for over 30 years, teaching the largest pre-med courses, some of the medical courses. And it's just been a great, great journey. Uh, I want to just quickly introduce you to someone who's very important to me. We have today, because we're going to have a week of activities centered around him, we have in our audience today the head the chairman of the Nobel Prize Committee on Literature, the person who gives the Nobel Prize in Literature in Stockholm, Sweden. He's Dr. Per Vesper. Per, will you stand, please? <laughs> He's a graduate of Harvard College, 1955, lived in Adams House. So you see, you, you can't go to Yale University and meet the head of the Nobel Prize Committee, so please know that. <laughs> I'd like to share with you a story that's very dear to me because I teach students here in neuroscience and biophysics, as uh, Dean Martin Lewis said, and that's one thing we could talk about. But I want to talk to you today about something that's equally important to us at Harvard. We want to develop students who are not just automatons. We know you're all very bright. We want to develop people with compassion, people who have feelings for other people, for each other. We want to bring people together from diverse backgrounds who have an understanding of inclusion and equity and diversity. And so we really focus a lot on that here at Harvard to create a sense of community, a sense of oneness. Because you're here for three years and nine months, and after that you take off to the rest of the world. So I want to share with you a story about one of my experiences that involved the college. I involve students in everything. I'm a member of the Explorers Club of New York, so I climb mountains. I've lived in the Amazon. I've taken my students from Harvard College to the Amazon. I lived in the Andes Mountains with indigenous people. I take students there. I've even lived in Greenland, going toward the North Pole. I want to share a quick story with you. This is, uh, I see you can begin this story, I think, by the first slide. And you can tell me when it's going to come on. So I think I've got it here, or, or you started here. I want to share very quickly with you a story of great importance to show you how we at Harvard have a very wide expanse here. And I think if it comes on, I'm still waiting. Normally that works. <laughs> what about now? Any changes? OK, good. And I think I can go back. Uh, I have great technical help here, as you can see. So. You're going to make this work for me. Thank you. This is a PowerPoint thing. Go back to the first one, if you don't mind. Just go back one. And this is Veritas Thinks Big. So I'm going to talk about overcoming big obstacles to keep a promise. It's important to keep your word. Now, that's a part of compassion to, uh, as well. Now, I'm going to move this forward. I think it's with the arrow. Is that correct? OK, very good. <laughs> there. Now, imagine 1909, 1910, T.S. Eliot whom Dr. Per Vesper told me he heard read right in this very Sanders Theater. T.S. Eliot was describing the era of exploration. We shall not cease from exploration. And the point of all of our exploring is to return to the place where we started and know that place for the first time. At that time, this entire country looked to the North Pole as being out in outer space. It was tantamount to reaching the moon in that time. Everybody here wanted to have somebody go to the top of Greenland to reach the North Pole. In Europe, in, throughout Europe, England, uh, in Italy, the Duke de Abruzzi, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Norway, they were all trying to reach the North Pole. But one American was determined. In fact, he was obsessed with it. Now, who lives at the North Pole? People that we have traditionally called Eskimos. They were called at that time the Polar Eskimos. But we say today Inuit people. It comes from the word Inuish which means the humans, because they thought they were the only humans on Earth. They live farther north than any other humans. And I know them as uh, Uta, Ugingwa, Okia, and Siglu. And they played an important part in American history, because whoever could reach the North Pole first could demand that it was America's military territory. And that's one of the reasons they were trying. Now, there was a man who was obsessed with this. He was from this area. He actually went to Bowdoin College. His name was Robert E. Peary. And he wanted to get to the top of the earth to be the first human being to stand there. That meant so much. And again, it was like reaching the moon in our time. You could only get there by dog sled. It was some four or 500 miles north of uh, the, the latest or the last spot of land. And that was the only way you could reach it. 
but nobody ever mentioned he had this man with him. He was an African-American from Washington, D.C. He was with Perry for all of the 18 years of exploration of trying to reach Greenland, but he was kept out of the history books. His name is Matthew Henson, Matthew Alexander Henson. The native people loved him because he spoke their language, he learned their culture, he taught Perry that he had to wear the indigenous people's garb in order to be successful. They call him Maripaluk, Matthew the Kind One, and he lived there in that area. <clears throat> now, it was later admitted by Perry because he had lost all the toes on his feet to frostbite, but it was Henson who took the American flag and planted it in the North Pole on April 6, 1909. That was so critical for America to maintain its status in the world. This man, Matthew Henson, with four Inuit, the one I've just named, uh, they stood there at the North Pole. We can now prove that that happened. Well, I have an interest in that area. Many of the Inuit people are ill. They have trichinosis because they eat raw polar bear. They have other diseases that we wanted to study, and I was working with a Danish team. How do you get there? There's no American Airlines or Delta going to the top of the world. I had to fly military planes. You have to get clearance. So here I am on a C-141, a big military jet flying to the top of the earth. That's the only way you get to Thule Air Base, which is the base where we watched the Soviet Union for 50 years with nuclear weapons stored right there. I'm going there to study. Among the things we study, most of the Inuit go deaf pretty early. The young boys start to lose their hearing at age 10 because they're hunting all the time. So I studied their hearing. You see there's a rifle there. I went out with this woman, she'd go out to hunt as well. And we'd follow each other around on the teams, and I've been doing this for years, to study all of their nerve impairment. And so I spent time doing that as part of my work. But let's get back to this man. Sometimes he would stay up there four years at a time. He was from a prominent American family. He was a commander in the Navy. He was married to a very lovely woman named Josephine. She was the daughter of a professor at Smithsonian Institution. And perhaps he got very lonely because what people didn't know, and he kept a secret for so many years, was that he had an Inuit mistress, and there was this little white baby here that he had left behind and never told anyone. The things that men would do at that time. He just left him behind, and assuming that all would be forgotten and no one would ever know. And of course, he had his partner of 18 years working to reach the North Pole with him, struggling with this man that I described to you earlier, Matthew Henson, and he too lived there for all that period of time. And of course, Henson would never do anything like that, I thought. Let me see, I think they're out of line. Yes, he did, there's a little baby with an afro <laughs> sitting right there. <laughs> And he had a woman too, and her name was Akatingwa. The first woman was Alakasina. And they were born days apart on Perry's ship. One little part African-American Inuit kid, and one little uh, part European-American kid. And they left them there, and no one ever heard about them. And then comes this silly little Harvard professor who teaches neuroscience at Harvard and biophysics, and he's just up there looking around. And what did he find? He found both of them at age 80, and there they were, Anauka on the left side here, Anauka Henson, and on the other side is Kali Piri, Admiral Perry's son and Henson's son. They didn't want you to know about them, and sure enough, I found them. Now, it's one thing to find people. I spent time with them. I travel out, and I rush through these. I would go out. They were still hunting. We're on our dog sled. They would go out to hunt their seal traps. I love this. I took students with me. And we'd go out, and then you see, I got to know them. And I came to know them very well. I would eat their food. We had some nice walrus head. That's delicious. Everything is eaten raw. If you've never eaten walrus head, you don't know what you're missing. It's very delicious. And that's the grandson of Henson. He's a full-time hunter. And then when we have delicacies in the house, we have a giant walrus heart. Like you have potato chips and dips, we eat walrus heart. It is so good. It tastes like, um, like cardiac muscle. I mean, it's, it's really great. That's what we do at Harvard, these exciting things, you see. And so that's Perry's uh, grandson, or his great-grandson. He's a hunter still today. I brought him down here to Harvard. 
He's an amazing young man, but he goes out hunting with his screen and his rifle to shoot seals and walruses so they can stay alive, just like we eat cows and pork or whatever. That's what they eat. And there's the youngest one. We built an igloo together. There he is in his igloo. That's Matthew Henson's great-grandson, Mashingwak, who became a dear friend of mine. And so you see, these are quite interesting people. And just before I left, the two of them came to me and said, you know, we're going to die soon. Most of our people here as Eskimos don't live beyond about 65. We're 80, we're going to die. And we have one dream we've had since we were children. Our fathers abandoned us. Can you help us, Alan Palu, they called me. Can you help us just to go to the land of our fathers before we die and touch the skin of a relative? I never had anybody ask me about anything like that. Can you help us go and just touch the skin of a relative before we die? We've never seen any of our relatives anywhere, and we must have some. I gave them my word, and that's the whole point of this. You have to try. I said to them, I don't know I can do it. It's a huge obstacle. I mean, there's no airline flying here. I have to get permission from the US Air Force, from the Defense Department. I said, but I will try, I promise you. Sure enough, I wrote the President of the United States. <laughs> we think big at Harvard. <laughs> and I said, would you please help me? I shared the story with him. And before I knew it, I had a letter from Ronald Reagan saying, I'm so moved, I'll be happy to help you. <laughs> so, I was so pleased, I told them, I went back up to see them, I flew them out of their villages by helicopter, and I said to them, you're going to see your relatives. They were so happy, they were in tears. I put them on a big C-141, we call it the Green, Jolly Green Giant. It's huge, it's so magnificent a plane. And I had my students on there too. And I had student hosts for each of them because they brought 12 of their respective children right here to Harvard. We flew them in and there's the president of Harvard in this very building. President Derek Bach gave them a banquet. They had never been any place before out of their village. This was just overwhelming to them. These two little Inuit men who had dreamed of coming to the land of their fathers. They got here to Harvard and they were treated very beautifully. And the man to the right of the president is John H. Johnson, who's the founder of Ebony Magazine. He actually sponsored most of this because Henson had helped him to get his magazine started. Here he met his relatives for the first time. He said, I, I knew I must have relatives. So he brought gifts from Greenland. He's meeting his American relatives. This is Matthew Henson's son, Anauka, for the first time. Now sadly, and it's in the book if you want to read it, it's called North Pole Legacy. Sadly, the white families did not want to meet Kali. They felt that it would embarrass their family name. They felt that the revelation of having a quote, they call it, illegitimate child by their grandfather would embarrass the family name. I argue that there is no illegitimate child, they're only illegitimate parents. And so I said to them, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find a way. And my students here at Harvard were really upset. They wanted him, Kali, to see his family. We went to New York, and all of the black churches, they welcomed Kali like he was a family member. They would ask him to stand and applaud him. And he would say to me, the Kalnaktuko people are fine. Kalnaktuko means dark. Kaduna means light. He said, they are so fine to me. But finally, I kept calling the Perry family, saying, please let him meet his family. I learned he had an 83-year-old brother alive not far from here. Finally, my grandmother said, have you talked to any of the women in the family? I said, no. She said, that's your problem. Call the women in the family. <laughs> I called the wife of, uh, of the son of Perry. Uh, he had an 83-year-old son. She said, bring him on up. So for the first time in his life, Kali Perry, I drove him with 12 students all the way to Augusta, Maine, 12 Harvard students, he met his brother for the first time. That's all he ever wanted to do to touch the skin of a relative. Well, he wanted to lay a wreath at his father's grave, so I got him to do that in Arlington National Cemetery. There he is, laying a wreath at his father's grave. Perry was put in this giant, beautiful tomb by National Geographic, but National Geographic did not want to take part in the burial of a colored person at that time. So what they did, was Henson was buried in this common grave. And the Eskimos asked me, why is, the, is Henson, who was so close to Perry, buried in this common little grave, and Mr. Perry's in the giant tomb? How do you explain that? They were such good friends. I couldn't 
explain to them the nature of racial differences in our society at that time. But I promised them I would do something to change this. So what did I do? I wrote the President of the United States. <laughs> So the President of the United States said, yes, I could disinter Henson's remains from this common grave and reinter them among other American heroes in Arlington National Cemetery. The man you see to the right there in the white garb is the Reverend Professor Peter J. Gomes, who until recently, after 40 years, was our minister here, the chaplain of the Navy, the first black astronaut in space, Jan Bluford is there in the blue suit, and look at the uh, pallbearers. That's Henson's grave, uh, Henson's casket, uh, we were able to get new caskets for them and bury him and his wife in Arlington National Cemetery. So right beside Perry's beautiful, large, white granite monument that National Geographic built for Perry, I was able to put a large black granite monument <laughs> right there. And you see with Henson's face in bar relief, and I included the name of all of the Inuits, all of the Eskimos on the grave site. And we unveiled that in Arlington National Cemetery. It was quite an achievement. And the last part of this, we got a... We got a uh, stamp name for him uh, with Harry and Henson both on it. We even got a ship name for him, the USNS Henson. It's an explorer ship. And there it is. It's really a spy ship, I think, but it's an explorer ship. And there it is. And I went on the maiden voyage with my daughter, Filippo. You see her saluting. She's here today. Uh, she was 10 years old. And we went out on this big, beautiful ship on the maiden voyage. And then we got Henson a title. He never had a title. The Navy finally named him Command Master Chief after about 20 letters from me to every admiral in the Navy begging them to please give him a title, and they did. But here's the end of this very quickly. They said to me when the anniversary of the discovery of the North Pole comes around in 2009, we want you to go to the North Pole and call our father's names out. How do you do that? I said, well, I give you my word again, I will try. You have to overcome big obstacles. So I tried to head out there. So I built this as a capsule case, the American flag, the Holy Bible that Henson carried with him, or one like the one he carried with him, uh, to the North Pole, books by Perry and Henson, polar bear claws and sealskin gloves that are sacred to the Inuit Eskimo people. And I put this case together, and I had to get this, I had a backup one, by the way. I had to get this to the North Pole by April 6, 2009, and that's the end of this. I started off trying to get there. I got a letter from our new president. <laughs> It was so nice to take all the way there with the President Obama, who liked this idea. And there I have the letter. And I was going to deliver it to the families. And there the Air Force came to visit me at Harvard, said, we like this idea. We're going to fly you there on a C-130. I said, great. I can take the Henson family and the Perry family from Greenland. We land at the North Pole. We get out. We call their father's names. We read a paper or whatever. And they said, great. About four weeks later, they called me back and said, we're sorry. We can't do it. Because of global warming, you need three meters of ice to land that big C-130 at the North Pole. And it turns out, I had heard from a Swedish Navy person that the Russians had lost a plane there because it was only one meter of ice there at the North Pole, so they couldn't land. We had to overcome another big obstacle. I was gonna keep my word to these old men. So in short, I chartered another plane, a smaller one. And I needed some courage I needed somebody to be with me because this was just getting to be too much. So I asked my 16-year-old daughter, Olivia, to join me. And she had the courage to join her father to go there. And there we are. We flew by jumping across Canada all the way to the top of the earth. That's the last village on the earth, by the way, people. The last settlement called Karnak, north of our military base, Thule. So we were able to land the plane there and go in. I was going to take the seats out, put in barrels so we could take off, use the fuel in the barrels to get to the North Pole. I was still prepared to go to keep my word. It turns out that we tried that. We landed. We got with the Eskimo people. That's my daughter, Olivia, some of the Inuit families who uh, were part of the Perry Henson family. We stayed there. There's Olivia with Avia Henson's great-granddaughter, who's a teacher in Greenland now. And we were talking about how we we're going to get to the North Pole. We decided to celebrate. We brought all the Hensons and all the Perrys together. These are the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren of those two explorers. And I leave you with this. I also gave President Obama's letter to the Inuit people. You can see the Greenland flag, the American flag. And they wanted a picture of the first family. They said, all the Eskimos up here, we voted for President Obama. <laughs> I said, how could you vote? <laughs> but they loved him. 
And so we had a cake. It says 100 or, which is Danish for years. Perry and Henson, that's the grandson of Robert Perry on the left. And over to the right there is the grandson of Henson. We celebrated with a cake. And we were all set to go to the North Pole. But the pilot said, no, we can't do it. We'd die. We could make it there, but we might not be able to make it back. Now, I've been around a long time, and I'm not afraid of falling out of whatever. But I had my daughter with me, and I was not going to take a chance with her life. So I told him, well, how do we do it? He said, well, the only way you can do it is by dog sled. And I said, well, we'll try. <laughs> so I trained my daughter Olivia to use the dog whip. <laughs> and we're going to go to the North Pole. And there we are. We're headed. <laughs> But we realized we couldn't go the 400 miles. And so I said, I have to give up. And Olivia said, Dad, you never give up. And that was encouraging to me. You know, is the Latin in vinium, ot fossium, means I'll find a way or I'll make one. And it turns out, we decided I should call Admiral Melvin G. Williams, Jr., the commander of the second fleet. If we can't get there by air, if we can't get there by dog sled, if we can't get there with an icebreaker, Maybe I can get there under the sea. So I contacted Admiral Melvin G. Williams, Jr. and said, could you give me a submarine? <laughs> he said, uh, he said, you know, he, he couldn't say yes or no. You don't say that in the military. He said these words, I think we can find a way to support this patriotic and historic endeavor. <laughs> That's what you say, you know. And so sure enough, he said, can you rendezvous with the USS Annapolis? I've got a nuclear submarine up there, a hunter killer submarine. I said, what you're supposed to? Yes, we can. <laughs> so sure enough, <laughs> you think big at Harvard, don't we? This is the USS Annapolis breaking through the ice. The uh, commemorative case was delivered. And sure enough, there it is in the ice. You see the case there, the crew got out, and there they are with the case you just saw, that's Commander Michael Bruner, who commands the USS Annapolis, a nuclear submarine with 12 vertical tubes for nuclear-tipped Tomahawk missiles, and they take my little case out. <laughs> Here it is at the North Pole, commanding officers, and Perry's and Henson's names were red. We achieved our goal, and we returned the ship. The ship came back to New Groton, Connecticut. And I took a group of Harvard students down. Here's the case being returned by Admiral Melvin G. Williams, Jr., the man to the right, who was in charge of the submarine fleet, who gave you that nuclear submarine, and the commander, Bruner. And then my Harvard students, and I'll end it there. So when you come to Harvard students, you get great opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> you will get a chance to go to this. <laughs>